Hello and welcome back. So in this lecture, we are going to cover our last of the three big international relations theories, and that is the theory of constructivism. Now, of course, you recognize the, the name constructivism from our discussion of identity politics. And indeed, this is a very broad social sciences theory that's important not just to understanding identity politics, but is important across lots of different disciplines like anthropology, sociology, and is important to international relations. And so there's going to be some, some strong similarities uh, between the, the theory of constructivism that we met when we were talking about identities and the theory of constructivism at the international relations, the international relations level. They share the same key insight, and of course the origin of the name constructivism, is that social reality is constructed. Now what do we mean by that, reality is constructed? They don't mean that there are no objective facts or truths in the world. Um, that two plus two, you know, may or may not equal four, depending on your perspective. They don't, they don't neglect that there are real brute facts about the world. But what they're saying is that social reality is very uh, kind of wishy-washy. It's open to manipulation and construction. So they're not ignoring that reality is, is an important thing. But what they're contributing is that individual people or policymakers and even states are going to have perspectives and the way that these different actors see one another, view their histories of interactions with one another, uh, see possibilities for future collaboration or conflict with one another, that creates a social reality that is going to be very, very important. And so they look at the study of international relations, these constructivists, and they say, huh, there's a really big concept that, that all of you other international relations theorists and realism and liberalism just take as, as given, when actually it's not a natural law, and that is the idea of anarchy. So they're going to actually agree that yes, empirically, right now in the world, it is the case that there is a high level of anarchy in the international system. But whereas realists take this as just the natural order of things, that it's, it's logically impossible to overcome this problem of anarchy, constructivists say very famously, Anarchy is what states make of it, and this, uh, this, this is actually the title of a piece of scholarly research by this, this scholar Alexander Wendt, and, and this really is sort of the bumper sticker version of constructivism applied to international relations. But yes, there's anarchy on the international system right now, but that's not the way it has to be. We can imagine a world in which there is real binding public authority at an international level, uh, and so they're going to sort of to sort of say that there are there are a lot more possibilities than realists or even liberals at the international relations level would say. They argue that the world that we live in is is anarchic. Uh, that's true, but it's not because of the structure of the world. It's because of processes, because of how we behave. If we behaved differently, if if, if if individual states and groups of states behaved differently, we could have a different world that wouldn't be anarchic. And so. Constructivism is going to allow for a lot of room for flexibility uh, and a lot of room for individual actors and leaders to, to matter a lot. You know, for realists, there's not a whole lot you can do if you're an individual leader. Uh, you know, you can try and increase your economic and military strength, but you're sort of given this uh, level of hard power and you have to make that level of hard power work maybe by balancing power, you know, finding the right allies. And that's about all that you can do. Well, constructivists are going to say, no, leaders can create identities. Leaders can try and minimize identities. Uh, if, you're, if a leader is worried about conflict with another state, they can try and convince their people that, that you know, the differences between these, these groups are not as big as they want. Or conversely, if leaders want to, uh, you know, increase their own poll numbers at home, they can try and create identity conflict with other, with other states. Uh, so constructivism is going to be actually really useful because it brings so many more variables to the table beyond just hard or soft power. Uh, identities matter, history matters, um, culture matters. And that is really useful uh, because it allows for the fluidity of interactions among states that we really see in the real world. It's going to be tricky though because when you have so many different variables to choose from it's actually really hard to predict what would happen. Uh, whereas realists love to make nice predictions as you can see if you ever go on a foreign policy magazine and read lots of, lots of work by realists who are always predicting what will happen with Iran or with Russia or with China or with North Korea.
A key element of constructivism is the idea of intersubjectivity. So we've met this word uh, subjective before, right? Subjective is the opposite of objective. Objective means just brute, real facts about the world. Two plus two equals four. Subjective means uh, open to individual perspective and interpretation. Uh, intersubjectivity is the, it refers to the subjective views between two actors. So the way that you and uh, a loved one, or you and a friend, or you and an enemy see one another, that's the intersubjectivity uh, of your relationship. And constructivist international relations theory our theorists are going to be quite concerned with intersubjectivity between states. So it's not enough to just look at the United States and China in terms of their hard power to predict will they get along, what will they do. Constructivist theorists are going to say you need to look at their long history of relationships. How do the Chinese and the Americans see one another? How do they view their relationship? And they're going to say that comes from their long history of interactions with one another. Um, and so intersubjectivity requires several different actors to sort of be in a dialogue with one another, to be thinking about one another and perceiving one another. If it's just how the United States perceives China, that's just the U.S. subjectively perceiving China. But if it's how the U.S. and China perceive one another and that unique relationship, that's the intersubjectivity that is really important to constructivists. As we saw when we talked about identity politics, constructivists are very, very concerned with identities. And identities are indeed very key. Uh, and we need to answer questions like, what sort of state are we? Uh, what sort of state are the, uh, are the people that we're trying to predict? And constructivists are able to push back against realists in a lot of very interesting ways. So for example, realists are going to say, what's important is the level of hard power. That's all that's important. Constructivists are going to say, well, yes, hard power is important. Again, they're not denying objective reality. But they're going to say, the hard power that another state has is going to depend a lot on the identity of that other state and your identity. So for example, what if, you know, if I, if I tell you France has nuclear weapons? Okay, France has nuclear weapons. Well, what if I were to say, okay, Iran is getting nuclear weapons or, or North Korea is getting North nuclear weapons? Now, realists uh, can, obviously can get around this uh, through some very smart thinking, but, you know, the basic idea of realism would just be a country with a nuke is a country with a nuke, and, and that is a threat. Uh, it doesn't matter who they are. Constructivists are going to say, no, obviously it matters who the the country that has this hard power is, right? If the country that has more hard power is, is Canada or France, you know, we see them as a friendly state. Our intersubjective understanding of one another is that we are sort of part of the same uh, worldview in many ways, uh, long historical uh, pe periods of peace and prosperity. We're not worried about, uh, you know, increases in armaments in Canada. Uh, but if another state increases their armaments, if China and North Korea are, are arming up even more, well, then we might worry about that. And that's because of the identity that we have relative to them because of our intersubjective, uh, intersubjective understandings. Now, remembering back to constructivism, uh, a lot of the time, identities are based on objective facts about people, um, different language, different race, different this, that, or the other. But you don't necessarily need that. Identities are very fluid. And this is where we talked about political leaders having an opportunity to maximize identities, minimize identities, even create new identities. Uh, there's a lot of fluidity and flexibility when it comes to uh, the international relations theory of constructivism. And this is also very closely related to the idea of, of norms. Uh, so we've talked about these norms. These are, these are, are ways, uh, practices that are very common that can influence our behavior. And, uh, you know, that this is what it becomes normal. And of course, that is really critical to our identity. Uh, the normal way of life here in the United States, the normal practices for diplomatic relations among states, these are norms that really influence behavior and really influence uh, how people perceive one another, uh, the identities that they ascribe to both themselves and, and to the people that they are dealing with. Um, so constructivists are, are going to agree with a lot of other international relations theories theorists that things like anarchy are important, they're going to say that anarchy and sovereignty and such, these are norms. They're not natural laws. They're not inevitable. They're not unavoidable. They are, in fact, things that we can influence. And so constructivists are going to allow for a lot more flexibility. So 
sit down if you're not already sitting down to show you some more brilliant artwork. This time I changed some colors of the states because constructivism is wild, right? This is the idea that these are individual states. There can be, all of these states are going to, each pairing, right? They're going to have a different intersubjective uh, perception of one another. And these are going to be the things that matter. Not necessarily just the hard power or even the soft power, but how the states perceive one another, their histories of, of interactions, right? Have they been slighted? Have they been historical allies? What are they? Are they culturally similar, culturally opposed? Uh, all of these things matter. And you can emphasize certain things that matter at, at certain times over other things to really change outcomes on the international level. All right. so. That is our third and final major theory of international relations. As always, get in touch if you have any questions, comments, or concerns. Good luck with the course material. Uh, I'll look forward to hearing from you.